there as well as we search for those items. Since March 29th, we've had individuals injure nine of our staff members. Some of these attacks resulted in serious injuries evidenced by our two exhibits here. In the first photo, you see the arm of a deputy who was bitten so hard that it went through two layers of clothing and broke the skin. Before the incident, uh, this individual was actually fully restrained and not just in handcuffs, but in what we have uh, as additional restraint gear to restrict his movement of his arms and his legs. Uh, and despite full restraint gear, that individual still was able to attack our staff member and the deputy sustained those injuries. In the second photo, you see a lump on one of our deputy's heads caused by impact of hitting the floor after his attacker punched him twice. That individual was unrestrained at the time and there were two deputies on scene. The individual decided to attack our deputy here in the picture. These are just a few examples of the injuries that our staff endure when confronted with individuals who attack them. Over the past week, as I mentioned, we've had a number of deputies go out on injuries that include punches to the head, face, and neck, being spit at and kicked in the head, slammed against walls, which result in the injuries of bone fractures, dislocated shoulders, and bloody eye sockets. Uh, these are injuries that we are still actively investigating, and we are looking into the underlying causes and potential conditions for each individual case. So far, we don't believe that they are related, but this is, again, ongoing investigations that we are looking into. Working as a deputy in San Francisco jails is a very dangerous job. Deputies work hard every day. This is a product of the work that we do, and it's unfortunate. We are prepared in dealing with people in crisis, in dealing with people with behavioral health problems, in dealing with people who have exhibited violent behavior. And we have safety measures, training, and plans in place to keep everyone safe, to be able to de-escalate, to be able to make sure we create an environment that is safe and responsive to the needs of the incarcerated individuals. However, part of our work does involve having to deal with physical assaults. There are some reasons why we are experiencing an uptick in these. Although we are short-staffed, we don't believe that is one of the primary factors. We believe that part of the reason is because currently with only two jails open, two housing facilities where people are incarcerated for extended lengths of time, there is insufficient space for us to be able to spread those individuals out and create a more calm environment for people to reside in our housing units. One more important factor is that those that remain in custody here in San Francisco are mostly serious violent offenders who are charged with serious violent crimes and who remain in our custody for extended lengths of time. It takes a significant amount of time for criminal cases to reach a conclusion and any delays in court result in more time and stays in our jail. Although we are still investigating the specifics of each incident, I felt it was imperative to conduct a thorough investigation looking into the underlying causes of this recent, recent uptick, which is why the lockdown itself was necessary. It initiated on Friday and went through the weekend. And again, we are opening up County Jail 2, which is at 425 7th Street tomorrow. And we anticipate opening up County Jail 3 at the San Bruno Complex later this week. We're working to do our best to prevent any further incidents. I want to mention that our department core values are service, professionalism, and pride. And those of our staff that work in the jails are serving members of our community that have been separated out from all of us here on the streets and in our communities and placed in incarceration because of criminal charges, because of behaviors, which are harmful to others. The deputies work with these individuals every day. That is the service they provide to our community. It is very challenging to deal with violent people, people in crisis, people who don't want to be 
incarcerated. And I always mention to people as we talk about how our jail population has increased, deputies and myself have an easier time when there's less people in jail. So we're not looking to keep people in jail for a long period of time. The challenge for us is to deal with people in crisis, to deal with people who don't want to be there, and to deal with people who exhibit behaviors like this that result in injuries to staff. Our second core value is professionalism. That professionalism is exhibited by our deputies every day. And I want to mention also that we're not alone in the jails. We have jail health services staff. We have members of the community who come in and work with us side by side in order to provide a healthy environment, a helpful environment, one in which we can prevent these types of incidents. Those individuals are also a part of uh, attacks, a part of being victimized by being assaulted. On Friday, we just had a health care worker who was spit in the eye uh, and traumatized by that event while they were trying to help an individual. Uh, so this is challenging not just for our uniform staff, but for our partners uh, in health care, behavioral health, and community members and our professional staff. And that's a part of the professionalism. While we're in there, we're working to help people and we're maintaining a level of professionalism which sometimes leaves us exposed to being attacked as we have been attacked recently. I can't be more proud of the staff, both the sworn staff and those that partner with us. I can't be more proud than how they behave professionally inside of our system. And that leads to my third reference to our core values, which is pride. Recently, some individuals have advocated for bringing in other resources to help us with our current issues that we face in the jails. I want to say right now, unequivocally, we don't have a need for anyone else to come in to help us at this time. I have absolute confidence in our staff. I have absolute confidence in their professionalism. I have absolute confidence in how they do the job that we can deal with the current situation, that we can create a better and safer environment with the people and the resources that we have right now. And that is what we are trying to address. Sometimes the words like lockdown can be very provocative. I hope that by sharing all of this information with all of you today, that this creates a better understanding of what we go through every day in our system and that lockdowns are a necessary part of how we respond to things in order to make sure everyone stays safer. And with that, I'd like to open up the floor to any questions anyone might have. Uh, before I do that, though, I do want to recognize that a, a large number of the members of my staff are here today. Um, and although we are short-staffed, they are standing here with us uh, because this is something important to all of us collectively and something that we are all united in dealing with collectively. And as you can see as evidence here by not just command staff, but our regular day-to-day -day staff by our partners in the healthcare community, we're here because we are here to solve this issue and deal with this problem ourselves. Uh, with that, does anybody have any questions? Sure, Crystal Bailey with KTU. Um, can I just have you clarify, you mentioned jail two and jail three at different times. When will each of them open? Certainly, so just for clarity too, uh, we have three jails. County Jail 1 is our intake and release facility. Uh, that is not a housing facility. That is where people are processed in and out. Uh, we experience injuries to staff there as well. Uh, but the focus on the lockdown itself is on County Jail 2, which is located at 425 7th Street. That is the facility that will back open up to normal operations tomorrow. And County Jail 3 is located at the San Bruno Complex. That location uh, had a critical incident today that we dealt with, so their opening will not be until later this week. We're hopeful that it will happen before Friday, though. Sheriff, you mentioned that you believe that weapons were involved in today's incident. Can you further explain what weapons may have been involved and kind of the current situation right now? Uh, so the majority of the incidents that have caused injuries to our staff recently have involved individuals that do not have weapons, and which sometimes is more impactful when it comes to uh, 
the traumatic effects on not just our staff, but on people who witness these events. Um, a lot of these situations involve people who are incarcerated. All of these situations involve people who are incarcerated. Uh, so we're not experiencing gun violence, uh, but there are jail-made weapons, which sometimes are referred to as shanks. Uh, there are sharpened instruments. Uh, there are blunt impact instruments that all can be used out of just normal things that you find every day, anywhere. Uh, we're currently searching for types of weapons of this nature in the recent incident that we just had occurred. And then, just to follow up on, you know, this current incident that happened today, what gives you the confidence to lift the lockdown after, you know, this close week that we've been in our jail for? Uh, we have a, an approach that involves not just opening up the doors and having people come out again outside of their cells, uh, their cells but we also have uh, plans to make sure everybody is well informed as to what happened, what transpired, the reasons why we went into a lockdown condition, and the behaviors that we expect from everyone moving forward. Uh, we're hopeful that this will be a message which everyone feels safer after we open up the doors again. Uh, we also have, as a normal run of course in our job, uh, fights which occur on a regular basis, behaviors which still occur, uh, which are confrontational, and those of which have happened on a daily basis that aren't documented to this degree. So when we open up the doors, what that means is a lockdown, just to explain what a lockdown is, involves limiting movement of everybody. Basically, it's like a shelter in place like what we all experienced as a community during COVID. It's like a shelter in place where everyone has to remain in their homes and cells. And that's what we do. They still have access to legal visits. They still go to court. They still have access to health services. But other than that, movement is really limited. Um, you yes. said that you don't believe that understaffing is a factor here, um, but there has been an increase in the jail population. Meanwhile, deputies shifting to helping police on the streets. Do you not believe in that change in ratio? Has anything to do with it? And are you not planning to shift more deputies back to jails in light of this? I think we have to be realistic. As we see improved conditions out in the community and in the public, uh, individuals are getting help and services that they need. But um, even as we transition people into housing, even as we arrest people and move them into these areas where they can get help, um, the individuals who are most in need, the individuals most in crisis, are also some of the most challenging individuals to deal with. And we have seen an uptick in our population. Uh, there has been more people who are housed with us and incarcerated for longer periods of time. Uh, I believe that has an impact. In terms of the staffing issue, though, being short-staffed, we still have deputies on staff that can respond to these incidents. Uh, we still have support from the community, as you can see from the comments from the cars. Going back on track to answer your question, though, the short staff, we have people that still respond. And all of these attacks are on individuals. Some have occurred with more than one deputy present. So uh, the individual incidents uh, aren't affected by our short staff. Yes. How many people are currently housed in county jails to the uh, I believe our overall total out of this morning was 1,182. 44 of those individuals were down at County Jail 1. The remainder were at CJ2 and CJ3. What was that last part? The remainder were in our housing facilities at County Jail 2 and County Jail 3. And then how many deputies are assigned to jails right now? On paper, we have 494 that are supposed to be assigned to the jails. But to go back to the staffing issue, I have about 364 deputies that are currently assigned to the custody division that are working. Are there any plans to open an additional uh, Right now we have the annex opened out there, which is a dormitory style facility, uh, which, uh, which has the capacity to house up to an additional 200 plus more individuals. We currently have close to 100 there right now. And we have, if necessary, we have plans to open up the additional dorms. I said if necessary and the count to continues to increase, we'll be able to open up additional dorms. And so with the statement that was made this weekend by the Deputies Association, the union representing kind of the rank and file, what is your reaction to that as far as 
this great amount in either communication or trust that has happened between you and the union to have them coming out asking for the National Guard to come help? Well, that's a good question. I don't want to frame it as something where it's a conflict between both of us because we are saying that we are trying to address this issue. Uh, when we talk about the statements made about the request uh, that the union president made to the mayor, the city, and myself uh, to ask for help from the state and the National Guard, uh, we don't feel that this is a exigent circumstance that would require that at this time. Uh, we believe that our help and our mutual aid with other places uh, occurs when there is a significant event or significant issue. Uh, the recent uptick uh, in the assaults on our staff is something I believe that we can handle internally and doesn't rise to that level. I do want to say that we all work together to try to get things better for all of us. And as was mentioned earlier about short staff, we have had challenges being supported in getting more staff here. Some of that has been addressed with the support we received from the city, but there are other factors involved as well, such as trying to recruit and hire individuals, because for all the support we do get in terms of having uh, positions that are funded and supported, we still have to get people into those positions, and we have challenges in recruiting and hiring, just as the police department does. Do you have any response to the claims in that letter talking about the sleep deprivation, increase in anxiety, PTSD. I mean, it was pretty extensive in terms of the research that they presented as far as mandatory overtime and things like that to deal with this staffing crisis, as they called it. Yeah, so in regards to the sleep deprivation, we actually reduced the amount of time someone can be held over involuntarily drafted from three times during a work week till to two. We've maintained that now for the last few years. Uh, that's to reduce the amount of times people will have to stay and involuntarily work another shift right after working a shift. Uh, we have, obviously, a lot of overtime that people voluntarily uh, work, and people carry very heavy hours, and I understand that. In terms of the traumas that are inflicted upon us every day, it doesn't have to be those types of traumas. It could be witnessing that, or it could be just with dealing with people in crisis on a daily basis. Uh, the overall information that was shared in that letter was also department-wide. It wasn't just specific to the jail. And we have a number of staff that are out working in other places, in the courts, in the hospitals, uh, who deal with people in crisis, who deal with people with problems every single day. And those small traumas that affect all of us are a reason why we've really tried to increase the amount of support and funding for our wellness programs for staff. Unfortunately, it's a challenge for not just us, but for our other uh, sister and brother agencies in San Francisco to get that type of support when a lot of the funding and support has been pushed to community members uh, because that's where we're all meeting in the middle. This we have time for two more questions. This violence has happened under your watch, under your command has increased. So what is going to change from today moving forward to ensure this does not continue? Well, one, the fortunate thing is that I've been here for a long period of time. And I've had in my career instances that occur like this on a regular basis. The uptick is something that we want to address immediately, which is why we're doing what we're doing right now. Uh, there will not just be the lockdown, as was mentioned earlier, but the follow-up that we have that will involve not just our staff, but our command staff, uh, all of our resources, our partnerships with behavioral health and mental health and health care uh, will all be a part of what we do moving forward to address the concerns. Uh, one thing that we plan on doing is to make these things not happen again when the picture arrives, is to make sure that we have to make sure that we have town halls inside the jails, something that we've already done. We have what are called pod meetings. Uh, and that's something that's been in my experience. We want to make sure there's still voices for people. So if there is some sort of stressor that's being caused by the situation, People have a voice for that. We just recently partnered with a team from Chicago called Chicago Beyond, which has a holistic approach to uh, incarcerated settings and looks to the health of not just staff, but the incarcerated as well. That partnership was leveraged into information and data that we hope to share back as a way to make sure what we do is more informed this time around. So I hope to make sure that that is accomplished. And most importantly, though, 
We want to make sure that individuals who act out against our staff, who exhibit this type of behavior, are held accountable, not just administratively in our discipline process, but also if there are criminal charges, if there's criminal behavior, that that is also something that is pursued so that we hold people accountable. What exactly does the lockdown look like for you? Uh, as I mentioned earlier, it's like a shelter in place in your home. So you remain in your housing unit, which is a cell usually, uh, in the dorms. In the dorms, it's a little different because it's an open living space. So the dorms, there is some movement still, but there are no activities. So we don't have community members coming in to provide programs or services. We don't have uh, religious or uh, other types of meetings. And we don't have family or friends visiting at that time. Uh, we're looking into that right now. We'll be giving updates as to uh, when we find that out. Sure, there have been some uh, inmates that have said that the deputies have also assaulted them. Do you have any response to that? Well, we experience allegations because in these settings, we have to sometimes apply control holds. Uh, we do have levels of force that we do have to employ. Um, I will say that the challenge is, uh, especially in a custody setting, a lot of this has to do with going, uh, using physical control of individuals. And uh, recently, the attack that occurred to this deputy here, who uh, was assaulted, struck in the face multiple times, and actually landed on the floor, was lying on the floor. The only reason that individual stopped from continuing the assault and not responding to verbal commands uh, was the deployment and use of a taser. Uh, which is one of the tools that we have at our disposal and part of our use of force policy. And so uh, we do get complaints because people are not used to uh, the use of the taser. We do get complaints because we have to physically control people, uh, but we investigate those complaints thoroughly. And I want to acknowledge that um, recently with the implementation of the Inspector General's office, having that additional work with the Inspector General and the Department of Police Accountability who provide third-party independent investigations into some of these. Uh, one of the focuses there is actually on use of force, and uh, that is one of the areas in which any case that is uh, raised during these things, or in general, uh, involving the use of force, involve those third-party in independent investigations. That's all the time that we have, folks. Thank you very much for coming. Yes. Um, tell them we go. Uh, we'll be separately. Um, so thank you all thank for you, coming. Everyone. If you have any Appreciate questions, it. you can text me.